1 Peter and uh, chapter 5, verse 8. Let's read together. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Amen. Amen. Thank you for encouraging her. Thank you, Miss Deborah, for sharing your story with us. How many of you this morning recognize that we have an enemy? The Christian family has an enemy. Did you know that our families are in the target or the bullseye of the enemy? Are you aware of that? I pray this morning that as you've listened to Deborah's testimony, that God has really grabbed hold of your attention as parents, as grandparents, and as young people. You see, for what God has done in Deborah's life, He wants to do in our lives. Because the reality is, maybe our circumstances are a little bit different than hers, but the reality is, we are at war. And so this morning, I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 4. And I want to begin a new series this morning entitled, entitled Fight for Your Family. And by the way, we don't just fight, we, we fight to win. How many of you maybe watched some of the college football games yesterday, especially the Final Four? I mean, I'm telling you, these four teams, they did what? They fought and they fought and they fought. What an incredible example of fighting to win a game. And so... This morning, I want you to hear a couple of things in the introduction. Then we're going to walk through some biblical principles. Because here's what I want to do this morning. This morning, I really want to issue a rally cry. And I want you to hear me clearly. I want to issue a rally cry for you to, to learn to fight proactively for your family. And I want to give you a biblical strategy that you can implement so that you can begin to fight for your family. Now, I want to just begin with this statement. The world is a battleground, not a playground. Now, I know this may sound a little bit weird because we just went through Christmas. And in most of our homes, it was cozy, warm, and the reality of war was nowhere to be seen. Right? So easy in our land, in America, okay, amongst all of our prosperity, to forget something very important, and that is we have an enemy. Life is a war, and our family is in the bullseye of Satan. I want you to hear that. We have an enemy, life is a war, and our family is in Satan's bullseye. Did you know that the Scriptures from cover to cover... Reveal that there is a war behind the scenes of this world. And your family is in the war. I want you to hear me clearly. You say, well, when did this war start? This war began somewhere between creation and the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And it began in heaven when Satan, an angel that was created by God, he became filled with prideful ingratitude. In other words, he wasn't grateful for his place. He wanted God's place. And the Bible says his heart grew filled, was filled with pride and he rebelled against God. Because of his selfish desire to be in God's place, he rebelled against God. He led many other angels to do the same. And the Bible says as a result of his rebellion, he was, God kicked him out of heaven. And the war between Satan and God, between good and evil, it began. It began. This war was introduced in human history. When Eve was seduced and her and Adam both sinned against God. Remember the serpent, the devil himself deceived them into this. This conflict predates human existence. But now since Adam and Eve has fallen into sin against God, humanity is now in the battle. I'm in the battle. You're in the battle. We're in the battle. Let's say that together. We are in the battle. There's no way to escape it, folks. In fact, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, helps us understand. This is an incredible summary statement of the whole Bible. 
If you want to understand the whole Bible, just hold on just a few minutes. I'll help you. The Bible says that the Lord God said to the serpent, remember, that's the devil deceiving himself. Okay, he deceived Adam and Eve into sin. And the Bible says, because you have done this, because you have lured humanity into rebellion, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And then notice this next part. This is huge. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between what? What does it say? Between your offspring and hers. And then it speaks of a singular offspring of the woman. That's Jesus. He, you can say Jesus, who will be what? A offspring of the woman, virgin birth. Jesus will crush your head. That's a fatal blow. That's, that's the cross and the resurrection. He will defeat you. But you will strike his what? That's what we saw on the cross. The congregation, listen to me carefully. This passage of Scripture, and specifically this last statement, is a prophetic summary statement about all of human history. It is the story of the Bible. Life in this broken and sin-cursed world will be a constant struggle between Two seeds, a godly seed, a godly line, the seed of the woman, and an ungodly seed, the seed of the devil. Now, there are two seeds upon the earth. How many seeds are upon the earth? Two. There are two offsprings, there are two descendants, and they are at war with one another. And the Bible says that the ungodly line will burn with hatred and enmity against the true godly line as long as the earth stands. This is why the world hates the Bible. The world hates Christians. This is why we face persecution, because the ungodly line hates the godly line. This is very clear throughout the Scriptures. This explains the work of Satan all through the Bible. Don't just read the Old Testament like a history book. It it explains the work of Satan. What is Satan trying to do through the Old Testament? He's trying to stop God from bringing salvation through the godly line. And so, what do we see? Satan led Cain to kill Abel. Genesis chapter 4. But God gave Adam another son. What was his name? His name was Seth. Satan led the godly line to mix with the ungodly line. Remember? And what did that lead to? Great wickedness. And it was the world became so wicked that he had to destroy the earth with a flood. You remember that? That passage of scriptures in Genesis chapter 6. But what did God do? God raised up Noah and his family. And the seed, the line, was continuous. You see, Satan, all along the way, he's trying to prevent God from bringing the Messiah through this godly line. When we get to the New Testament, we see Pharaoh, influenced by Satan, possessed by Satan. And what is he doing? He's attempting to kill all the male children, all the babies of Israel. Why? Excuse me, I said Pharaoh, did I? I meant Herod. We can back up and do... Let's back up. Let's get to Moses, right? Remember, he uses Pharaoh to kill all the babies in the land. But what did God do? He raised up who? He raised up Moses. Then we get to the New Testament. I told you I'll get there. There's King Herod. Not Pharaoh. Herod, right? And what is, what is Satan doing through Herod? He's, he's, he's causing him to have all the babies slaughtered in Bethlehem. Why? In an attempt to kill the promised child, Christ. To stop salvation from coming. But what did God do? He warned Joseph and he told Joseph to flee for the child. Remember, they escaped unto what? To Egypt. Did you know that the Christmas story is actually a war story? It's a story, a war story between God and Satan. And in Revelation chapter 12, write that down, read it this afternoon. 
The Bible describes at, at the birth of Christ, the dragon, the serpent, he's there ready to devour this child. I'm telling you, life is a war. We have an enemy, and our children are in the bullseye of the enemy. I want you to hear me clearly. So where did this war start? In heaven, somewhere between creation and the fall of man. When was it introduced into humanity? When Adam and Eve did what? Sinned. Now we're in the war. Now I've got some good news. The war has been won. You say, well, how has the war been won? Through the virgin birth. Through the perfect, sinless life of Jesus Christ. Through the sacrificial and substitutional death of Jesus on the cross in our place. And ultimately through the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen, this war has been won. Amen? But then I've got even better news. This war will soon conclude when King Jesus comes back again. In Revelation, yes, yes. Revelation chapter 20 talks about how he will come back and he will execute final justice on Satan. He will cast him into the lake of fire. And he will cast all those who oppose him and reject him into the lake of fire. But what about us? Where does this put us? We know there's a war. We know we're in it. The war has been won, but it's not been concluded yet. And we're in it. So where are we at? We're living between the first coming of Christ and the second coming. Does everybody understand that? That's where we are on God's timeline. Between the first and second coming of Christ. And so the war is still raging. The battle has been won, but the war is continually to what? It's being continually fought. Now that Christ has come, Satan does all he can do to turn people away from salvation. Many people are not in church this morning because Satan has turned them away from coming to church. He'll do whatever he can to turn your child away from salvation. He'll do whatever he can to turn people away from the reality that, you know, one day we're all going to have to face the judgment of God. He doesn't, he doesn't want people to know that. He wages war against the church. And every family who embraces the mission to reach the world. Even when people do turn and follow Jesus, Satan does all he can to stop us from being used by God. Ask Miss Deborah. The spiritual warfare she dealt with this week, just preparing to come and stand up and speak. Ask my wife. The spiritual warfare I deal with every week is I prepare to come up here and speak truth. It's a real war. And I want you to hear me say this. Satan will do all he can to stop us from being used by God. He'll even turn others away from us, even our own family members. And I want to say this to you. Because I think it's really important that we hear Satan will do what he can do to turn Christians against Christians. He'll do whatever he can. And so what I want you to hear me say this morning, the devil really wants to hurt God. He's lost the war. But how does he hurt God? By taking as many children away from him from all eternity. And so what does the devil do? The best way to cripple the church is to destroy the family. Can I tell you? The family in our land is broken. Every Christian marriage, every parent-child relationship, every grandparent, every grandchild, I want you to hear me, is in the crosshairs of the enemy. The family, God's first institution, is the bedrock of every healthy society. You cannot find a healthy society if you don't have a healthy family. And can I tell you this? A Christian marriage, a Christian family, or a church that's living on mission with God is a major threat to the enemy. And D.O. Moody once said this, the devil never kicks a dead horse. 
If you're a Christian marriage, if you're a Christian family, if we're a Christian church on mission with God, I'm going to tell you something. We're not a dead horse. The enemy is going to kick. And so, congregation, in the book of Nehemiah, we get a beautiful picture of this great fight. And from this passage this morning, I want to issue a rally cry, but I also want to give you a strategy. And I really want to encourage you to embrace this and to begin to fight for your family. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your children. Fight for your grandchildren. Listen, listen. Fight for your children's children's children. I'm asking you to begin to fight for generational gospel impact. And from Nehemiah chapter 4, here's kind of the main idea. God calls us to fight for our family. And when we do, what will God do? He will help and deliver us. Look at that together. Let's read it together and let's read it really loud. God calls us to for our family. And when we do, He will help and deliver us. Look with me at verse 14 in chapter 4. Nehemiah says, Then as I looked over the situation. Now what is the situation? Remember, Nehemiah, he's not a prophet, he's not a priest. He was the cupbearer to the king in Persia. And, and, and God called him to leave that position and lead a group of, of, of Jewish people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, to be, rebuild the walls. And as they began to rebuild the walls, what did they face? They faced major opposition. And so Nehemiah, here in chapter 4, he, they're in the midst of building, rebuilding the walls, and they're facing intense persecution. So much so, if you look up there in your, in your text at verse uh, 13, it says, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at exposed places, posting them my families. Nehemiah put families on the wall, because you know what? Families will fight when they're fighting with each other and for each other. With their sword, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of the enemy. And then look at this last part. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious. And look at this charge at the end. Here's the charge. And fight for who? For your brothers. For your sons. Your daughters. Your wives. And your what? And your homes. This is the word of the Lord to the people of God. You say, well, how do we fight? Okay, Pastor Ed, I'm with you. I see the war. I understand it. I don't want the enemy to have my children or my children's children. What, what do I do? How do I go about this? Let me give you four simple steps. Ready? Number one, we begin our fight by staying alert and expecting attacks and opposition from the devil. Look with me back over to verse one. Verse 1, chapter 4, look what it says. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. Listen. The ungodly line gets angry when the godly line moves forward. Right? Sanballat is an enemy of God. He's a tool of Satan. <clears throat> and he's mad because, guess what? The Jewish people have come back to Jerusalem they began to rebuild the temple. They've reestablished the worship of God in the temple. And now Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls. The walls are a symbol of God's protection. The enemy doesn't want God's people to be protected. And so I want you to see that there's real anger. And the Bible says his anger greatly increased. He ridiculed the Jews. In other words, he began to make fun of them. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? They're a joke. Will they restore their wall? No way. Will they offer sacrifice? Will this place become a house of worship again? Not over my dead body, San Ballot says. 
Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubble, burned as they are? And then there's another enemy, Tobiah. He begins to criticize the Ammonite who was at his side, said, What they are building, if even a fox climbed on it, he would break down their wall of stones. In other words, he's insulting them. You imagine God's people working on a project to give honor and glory to God, to reestablish God's presence and the worship of God in the city, and the enemy coming against you like this? I want you to hear me say something. Nehemiah is a great leader because he doesn't have his head in the sand. He's attentive and he's alert to the threats. He's expecting of a spiritual attack. That attack. That's why when we go back over to verse 13, we, we see that he calls his people together. He looks over the situation very carefully, right? Why? Because he is expecting a fight. Are you expecting a fight? This is why Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be self-controlled and alert. Be self-controlled. Man. Hey, look, maintain your senses. Don't be a drunkard. Don't be a party a, a partier. Like, stay alert. We need our senses. We need to be aware of what's going on. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for a child, your child, your grandchild to devour. Peter reminds us there's a cosmic battle between good and evil. And he's reminding us that we must live in wartime mentality. That's what he's saying when he says be self-controlled and alert. D don't, don't fall asleep. Be aware that there is, a, there is a war. Because early detection is critical to overcoming the attack and resisting temptation. This is why com Peter commands us to stay awake. And listen, here, here's what Peter's really saying. You need to be serious about the devil. Most people today don't even give him a few seconds of their thoughts. Boy, I tell you what, if I was your enemy, I sure wouldn't want you to know I was. Because I'd sneak up behind you and I'd wear you out. That's what's happening in America. And I'll tell you something. The walls in this land are down. The walls of marriage are down. The walls of personal morality are down. Can I just tell you? The laws of civility. Look, in our political climate, the laws of civility is down. Like, we can't even talk to each other with respect. The walls are down in our land. And I know this seems a little bit crazy because in our cozy little homes over Christmas, by the way, in our homes, we have more than 95% of the other people that live in the world. Like, we are rich. And in our wealth and all of our coziness, right, our protected little homes, it's really easy to forget that we're in war. And so my point to you this morning is, do you recognize the war? Are you aware that the walls are down? Are you aware that the enemy has plundered our land? So step one of the strategy is stay alert, keep watch, expect opposition. You cannot be a Christian marriage, okay, and be free from the attack from the devil. You can't be a Christian family and be free from it. It's going to happen. You can't be living on mission. It's just impossible. So step one, stay alert. And expect opposition. Number two, from verses 4 through 9, we need to learn we fight by surrendering to God and persevering in prayer for our family. I hope you heard that in Deborah's testimony. As she battled, she tried to fix everything in her own strength for a long time. And God had to open her eyes to her need, not just her son's need, not just her family's need, but to her need. You know what? We need God to work in our heart too. And, and she realized that she needed to what? Throw up the flag. And throwing up the white flag isn't weakness, right? It's strength when we surrender in God. And we see this in chapter 1 of Nehemiah. And I'm paraphrasing. Remember, God pressed down the need 
to rebuild the walls on Nehemiah's heart while he was the cupbearer to the king in Persia. He was living in the lap of luxury. And God called him to leave a what? <laughs> a easy life, a plush life, and go back and do what? Go to war. <laughs> Fight. And so our first way of fighting is surrendering to God's plan and call on our lives. And then our second step is we're persevering in prayer. Look over there at verse 4. It says this. Remember, Sanballat and Tobiah, they're, they're beginning to criticize. They're beginning to insult. They're beginning to really get angry about what, what God was doing through Nehemiah and his people. And look at verse 4. Here's the first, first thing Nehemiah does. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Have you ever felt despised? You stand for Christ in this world, you will feel despised. His first step is prayer. He says, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Now, what is, what is he praying for? He's praying for God to demonstrate and execute justice on the enemy. These people are trying to stop the work of God. He says, turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over a, uh, as plunder in a land of captivity. Now, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, let me take them. He said, God, you take them. The battle is whose? The Lord's. Verse 5, do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from their sight, for they have what? Thrown insults in the face of of the builders. And so what's going on here? Nehemiah's praying, he's seeking God. And then look at verse 6 after prayer, so we rebuilt the wall till all had reached half its height. They overcome criticism, they overcome the ridicule, they overcome that initial wave of opposition through prayer. Through what? Surrender and prayer. God, we're here, we're on mission to do your work. Well, we got an enemy. We got a problem here. We're asking you to deal with them. And so they rebuilt the wall. They began to rebuild it for the people who work with all their hearts. Is that characteristic of the church in America today? The people at Central, every one of them, worked at the gospel with all of their heart. Verse 7. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard the repairs of Jerusalem wrong. In other words... They're, they're mad that there's a building project going on and worship's being restored. But now they're not able to stop it. But now they hear it's moving forth. There's progress. And it says, and they, they were become aware there were gaps that were being closed. This made them even more angry. Verse 8, they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. And look at verse 9, key verse, verse 9. But we prayed. Say that with me. But But central prayed. Well, I, I know you pray. But when do you gather with God's people to pray? I have no doubt you have an incredible personal prayer life. But I'm telling you that God calls us to pray together. We prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. In other words, they prayed, but they also were cautious and aware of what was going on. They prayed with their eyes open. Congregation, we fight by surrendering and we fight by persevering through prayer. The only way that we can win against the attacks of Satan, whether they're spiritual attacks. How many of you know that they're mental attacks? Not all of mental issues Okay, or medical related. Some of it's spiritual related. I'm, I'm not making light of some of it that's medical. I'm just saying some of it is spiritual. No drug's going to solve it. How I many of you know there's also physical attacks? The only way we win is through surrender and persevering through prayer. This is why Paul says in Colossians 4 2, he says, Devote yourselves to what? Not to preaching, but to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. Prayer is the one weapon that the devil fears the most. 
And yet, it's rarely employed until hell breaks out. You know when I see people praying? You know when I see families praying? When all hell breaks loose in their family. And my Riley cry this morning is, let's start now praying. Let's be proactive in surrendering to God and persevering in prayer. You say, well, what does that look like? Let me give you a biblical example. It's from the book of Job. It's Job himself in Job chapter 1. Look at this passage. It's an incredible passage. It says, Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts. He had seven of them feast in their homes, and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with him. How kind of these men to invite their sisters over for Christmas. What, what is this a picture of? This is a picture of a tight knit home. Job had led a godly home, and they celebrated together. They gathered together. They ate together. And everyone was invited, including the sisters. And by the way, in that world, okay, women were not considered to be honored guests. But they were in a godly home. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would do what? He would purify his children. What does that mean? He would get up early in the morning and he would offer a burnt offering for each of them. He would call each of them by name. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned. Now, I wish I'd have underlined that for you because here's what parents tell me today. My kid would never do that. Not my sweet thing. Not my innocent dove. Job was aware of the depravity of his own kids in his own life. Job's not thinking, you know what? I bet my kids went to a New Year's Eve party last night, and I bet they didn't sin a bit. I mean, I bet they're good with God. I'm, I mean, no, no. He just assumed that they probably made a boo boo. Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And let's read this last statement. Let's read it really loud so the people online can know that there's somebody here. Okay? Are you ready? Here we go. This was Job's regular practice. Oh, my goodness. What a picture of disciple making in your home. The dad. Calling their sons and daughters by name before Almighty God. Job consistently sought the Lord for their cleansing, their purification. He understood that, that people are careless and oftentimes we're sinful with our behavior. His children not only probably had sinned, but they, they needed someone to stand in the gap. And all this is pointing to our role as moms and dads and grandparents to pray for our kids. That's why, listen, that's why today when you came in, you were handed a 10-day prayer and fasting calendar. I want you to look at it for a moment. It's right there in front of you somewhere. Hopefully you've got one. This is not complicated. I'm trying to find my copy somewhere here. Got it. Here's what I've done for you. Each day there's one verse of scripture listed. And behind that scripture is a prayer that I've written. And there are blanks in the prayer. So look at day two, for example. It's Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's the verse that you, I want you to read with your family and talk about, explain to them. But then, mom and dad, this is what you pray for your kid. And so I'm going to put Hannah Grace, I'm going to put Daniel, I'm going to put Hunter, I'm going to put T.W. in this. I'm going to say... Father, I ask you to help Hannah Grace to reject the company of the wicked, the sinners and the mockers. Instead, I ask that you help her to delight in your law so that she may experience the joy and promise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, that's not our sermon, is it? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm asking all of us to commit to this this morning. For the next 10 days. Read this passage in your home somewhere, morning, noon, or night. 
and pray, putting the names of every child, every grandchild. What you're doing is praying scripture over your child. Anybody recognize the need to pray scripture over your children? How do we win? We persevere in praying for our family by name. And then number three, here's the third. We fight by drawing on the Lord's strength to stand for Christ and keep working. Look back over at verse 10. Actually, verse 14. Verse 14. He says, don't be afraid of them. Now, remember, Nehemiah's looked at it. He's, he's examined the situation. There's an enemy on the north. There's an enemy on the south. There's an enemy on the east. There's an enemy on the west. And so it's for you military guys like Terry and Mark. I like, they're surrounded. There's no way that these guys can win a fight if they get in a fight unless God does something. Nehemiah looks it all over and he says, well, we're surrounded by enemies on every corner. Okay, and then he says, don't be afraid of them. And then, he's, then he's, he says something that's incredible. Three words. Remember who? Remember the Lord. You know what that means? Draw on the Lord's strength to fight. Rely on Him to give you the strength to keep working. You see, Nehemiah's specific answers to the people's complaints and their discouragement. And their discouragement look, they're, 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 it's like draw on the Lord's strength. Go back up there at verse 10. I want you to see this. At verse 10, this is what the people in Judah said. The strength of the labels are given out. We're not, we don't, we, we're not going to make it. And there's so much rubble. We cannot rebuild the wall. We, we, we can't stay focused. This is beyond us. We're, we're not going to be able to win this battle, Nehemiah. Look at verse 11. Also our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Can you hear the chatter amongst the people? It's too big. The enemy's too much. They're going to kill us. We're going to have blood here. There's no way we're going to do this. And then look what happens. Look what happens. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. They were ready to quit. Weren't they? Have you ever wanted to quit? Be honest. I'm going to ask you, have you ever wanted to quit on your marriage? Have you ever wanted to quit on your children? Your grandchildren? And here's the big one. Have you ever wanted to quit on yourself? If that's where you are this morning, God is saying, remember the Lord. Draw strength from Him. Relying on Him will be the key to overcoming the enemy and winning the battle. And then lastly, the last part of our strategy. Remember what we're doing. We've got to expect opposition. We've got to be alert. We've got to be awake. We've got to surrender to God. It's personal. It's daily. It's moment by moment. Deborah's exactly right. This is not a one-time surrender. It's a daily surrender. We've got to persevere in prayer. We've got to persevere in prayer. And then listen. We, we've got to draw strength from the Lord so that we can stand for Jesus and we can keep on working. I want you to notice something. They're not just praying. They're also working. In fact, they go on. If, if, look with me at verse 16. It says, from that day on, half of the men did work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields. In other words, half of them are working and half of them are, are guarding and ready to fight. The officers post themselves behind all the people of Judea who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and they held a weapon in the other hand. And listen, if you're working on the wall, you need both hands. And so you're working. And so for those people, he had people standing with their what? With their weapons. But if you were carrying blocks, if you were carrying stones back Back and forward. You know, you, you could carry a block in one hand, material, construction material, but you could have what in your other hand? A weapon. 
And then look at verse 20. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Look at verse 22. At, at that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his help will stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and work men by day. In other words, hey, everybody, you're not going home today. You're going to stay here and you're going to work 24 hours a day because guess what? The name of our God is at stake. Verse 23 says, Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with, my, with me took off our clothes. Listen, they didn't even get a shower. They didn't even take off their clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for what? Even when he took a refreshment break, he had his weapon with him. Do you get a picture of the fight? It's serious. And so... We, we fight, congregation, we, we fight by drawing from the Lord's strength and His strength enables us to keep working and keep fighting and keep standing for Christ. And then finally, listen, we fight by bringing our family to corporate worship and bringing worship into our homes. Now, you've got to go to chapter 8 for this. Just turn over a few pages. Many of you know the story of Nehemiah, but if you don't, listen, let me help you. With all of this opposition, guess how long it took Nehemiah and his boys to build the wall? 52 days. That's what happens when we draw on God's strength. What happened after the wall was built? Nehemiah called for all the people to come together for a grand worship experience. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. When the seventh month came, this is after the wall had been built, the Israelites settled in their towns. All the people assembled as one man. That's, by the way, we've come to church this morning as one man. Unified in Jesus Christ. They assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the, the priest, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. Listen, everybody is there. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. That's six hours. Some of us go to sleep on the third verse. Seriously. In the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively what? The book of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now take your Bible real quickly and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is what Ezra read to the people. This is one part of it. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your strength. In other words, love Him more than travel softball. Love Him more than deer hunting. Everybody knows how much I love to deer hunt. Love Him supremely. Give Him first place. In your retirement, give Him first place. Whether you're just starting to rear children, give Him first place. That's what, that's what God's Word says. Then look at verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Mom and Dad, take it in. Impress them on your what? On your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. In other words, saturate your kids with the Word of God. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And to that I say, can you imagine what kind of impact that big worship service that Nehemiah scheduled had on all the children in that land? 
Dad and Mom, every time you bring your children to worship, you're fighting for them. I don't want you to come to worship because it makes me feel good or makes me look successful. I want you to come to worship because you put God first and you're fighting for your kids. Why do you think the devil fights families? And look, it, it don't ha- you don't have to have a children. Why, does he think, why do you think he fights you coming to corporate worship so much? How many Sundays do you actually feel like coming to service? Be honest. How many Sundays do you have to push yourself to do the right thing? Every time, Mom and Dad, you bring them, you are fighting for them. Every time you bring your children to sit under the Bible teaching of our leaders here, you're fighting for your feeling. I'm just saying the big church is critical in the fight for your kids. And Nehemiah demonstrated, he has this large worship service. He has them, look, they're listening to attendance. All the men, women, the children, everybody's there. This is a corporate experience. Can you imagine those young people talking about that worship service all their life? Oh, let me tell you, that's when God showed up. That's when no one was thinking about leaving. We were there to listen to the word and be changed by it. But listen to me, there's also a small church. And that's your home. Whenever you bring worship into your home, you're fighting for your family. You can fill your home with reindeer games if you want to. It can always be, it can be gaming and all these other things. But if God's presence and the worship of God is not present in your home, the enemy is going to swallow your kids. Dad, I want to ask you, are you going to leave it up to Pastor Robert to lead your child to Christ, or are you going to do it? Don't leave it up to a pastor to nurture your child to Christ. Do it. Don't do that. Every time you gather in your home to pray, every time you open the Scriptures, even, even, every time you acknowledge God's authority in your home, what are you doing? You're fighting for your children. Why do you think the enemy fights it so much? In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11, how many of you remember this story? You remember when David became king of Israel? What did the first thing he wanted to do? Let's take the ark, which was the presence of God, to Jerusalem. And they started taking it. And somebody irreverently touched the ark. And what happened? They died. And it scared David so much. David said, listen, I don't want the ark in my city. (laughs) Who will take the ark? In other words, who will have God's presence in their home? David was scared. He was scared. And the Bible says the ark of the Lord remained. He, they, they took it to a man's house, house named Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom had 70 children. And some of the mothers in here are thinking, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Draw strength from the Lord. <laughs> they took the ark into Oded, uh, Odom-Edom's house for three months And look what the Bible says. And I wish you could read verse 12 right behind it. I should not have cut it off. I should have brought it in there. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. In our devotion this morning as a worship team. David shared with us. Remember when Jesus was 12 years old? Mary and Joseph had brought him back to Jerusalem to a feast. And they were on their way back home. And after traveling a day, they realized that their boy went with them. And they got upset. They were searching, where's Jesus? 
What would good, any good investigator say? He's at his father's house. They went back and they found him where? And they went up to him and said, What are you doing? You're making us crazy. You've made us lose our mind. We thought we lost you. Why didn't you tell us? And he said, Where else would I be but my father's house? Doing my father's business. You can be in the house and not be doing his business. I say all this to say, we fight by bringing our families to corporate worship. Mom and dad, grandparents, do whatever you can do. There are 52 Sundays. Get them here to church. Get them to worship. But don't just bring them here. Bring worship where? In your homes. You say, how do I do that? On the back of this 10-day prayer calendar, let me stop and say something. God just reminded me something. Can I tell you something? This is probably one of the most meaningful things that's ever happened to me at this church. So I want you to listen to me. And I, I've seen some of your faces and that God just reminded me when I looked at you. There are some people in this church who have coveted with me and Christy to pray for our kids. And I mean they pray. And I just want you to know how grateful I am for that. Because you have helped us fight for our kids. And I say all that to say, this fight is not yours by yourself. Jeff, you don't have to do it by yourself. Proctor, you don't have to do it by yourself. Mac, you don't have to do it by yourself. Rob, you don't have to do it. Look around here. Who might God be leading you to say, hey, would you cover it with me to pray for my... Listen, listen. My kids, if the Lord so chooses, my grandkids, listen, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of people praying, 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 praying. We need each other is my point. So what will you do in 2023? What will you do to fight for your family? Will you walk around clueless, not even aware that the walls are down and our land is plundered? And will you leave your children's salvation? Will you leave their sanctification up to someone else? I've heard so many parents tell me that. Well, you know, I'll let my kids decide what they want to decide and believe. Well, they'll have they'll decide. Someone once said, they'll do mostly what you say until age 15. After 15, they're going to do mostly what they've watched you do. It's not always the case, but it has a lot of truth in it. What are you going to do to raise your children? Who are you going to let raise your children? Hollywood? School system? TikTok? Do you know that more people get their information from TikTok than any other source? Will you pray? Will you start today? Will you start tonight? In fact, in your worship folder, in that 10-day prayer calendar, on the back, there's a, there's a way for you to have a family worship time in your house and it's not it doesn't require you to get in a three piece suit it doesn't require four hours and 18 minutes but I want you to look at that and I want you to consider listen even if you don't have children in your home listen if you don't have children in your home and you don't know any children to pray for pray for mine will you do your best to have God's presence at the center of your home I told you at the beginning this was a rally cry, right? 
So take it for what it is. Please fight for your marriage. Fight for your children. Fight for your grandchildren. And fight for this gospel that's delivered us from darkness and given us new life. Let's pray together. I want you to sit quietly for just a moment. And just listen to God's voice. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What do you need to do this morning, tonight? What do you need to start? Father, we thank you that you are gracious. For we surely don't measure up. None of us. And Father, if it were not for your grace, we couldn't do any of this. But by your grace, I pray that you would give us courage to step forward in our homes, in our marriages, with our children and grandchildren. And I pray that you give us the same courage you gave those Jewish people to fight. To fight for our families. God, would you move in each heart this morning? Would you give us, Lord, just a willingness and openness just to be transparent about where we are? And I thank you, Lord, that you've given us people to surround us in this room to walk with us and to encourage us. Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.